All right. Today we're in Acts 4, verse 13. Um, there are blue Bibles under your chairs if you don't have one, and it would be on page 1010. Now, when they saw the, the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had, that they had been with Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Wow. Never has been a man been cheered for doing so little in life, Luke. I preach pretty good sermons, and I've never got that. And you read a sentence. That's our church. We like to encourage people. So welcome. Three-year anniversary. We've arrived as a church. We have a sign. We are officially a church. So give it up for yourselves. God's been watching like, I don't know, I don't see a sign yet, I don't know if this is the real deal, we'll see. We're the real deal, I think, we'll see. I guess eternity will tell. So I want to thank a few people. Three years ago we started this church, we moved out here from the Far East Valley with some families and some other families that were connected to Other Redemption, decided to join us, uh, and it's been a great adventure. It's been the it's been better than I could have dreamed. I remember driving home from a prayer retreat on the 101, listening to the song New Wine and just breaking down in tears because my life was in Chandler. Everything I loved was in Chandler. I liked my job. I had a pretty good existence, and God was calling me to something new, and I was just driving, just bawling like, it's about, it's about to change. It's going to be a new wine. God's going to do something new, and it's been worth every second of it. So I want to stop and just thank a few people. I want to thank the core team. This is not to neglect you if you weren't a part of that original crew, but that original crew is something sweet. Some of us gave up a lot. We gave up churches with great full kids ministry and youth ministries to come to this little startup church in a little gym on 24th Street and Cactus. So core team, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for trusting the Lord. But then personally, thank you for trusting me. I don't take this lightly. Pastoring is a unique deal. We're all going to stand before God and give an account for our lives. Pastors, part of that account I give is the lives that God has allowed me to be a part of stewarding. And a church plant is a really vulnerable space that you guys said, I'm with you. And you've trusted me, so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. To the rest of you, the beyond the core that make this church up now, I think of the Ken and Connie's of the world, people that have joined us, just beautiful. To thank you for being a fun church to pastor. I talked to a lot of pastors. I talked to church planners. I was just talking to a church planner planning a church out in Northwest Valley coming out of a, what usually is the story. A, a harder church environment leaves to start a new church. This wasn't that great. I had a great past church environment, so I had like a high bar in my mind, and this has been far better than I could imagine. I don't know if it's like COVID squeezed out all the weird Christians and we, what was left was, <laughs> but it, you, it's just a sweet, and I, that does not mean we've got our stuff together. We've got marriages and some deep stuff, having to navigate some stuff. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, generally, there's a spirit of, Jesus, what do you want us to do? Let's go do it. Let's do the hard work. So thank you. Um, yeah. And then, uh, finally, my wife, uh, pastoring. It's fun to act like pastoring is the hardest job in the world. It's not because God has called us to be pastors. I think being a doctor is the hardest. I think there's lots of jobs that are hard. This is not the hardest job. However, being a pastor's wife doesn't sound fun to me. <laughs> being a wife doesn't sound fun, and being married to a pastor doesn't sound fun, because you got to deal with me and then all this. Church is unique, church work, because where I work, where I worship, and where my friends are, all are the same co-centric circles. So it's just a unique space to live in. And this isn't, whoa, whoa, whoa is me. It's, I love my job. But Aubrey, behind the scenes, without any paycheck, without any recognition, just sort of helping this church be what it is. So... Yeah. So... Again, and the best gift you can give her is don't go up and start a conversation with her after. <laughs> Just pray for her, or if you see her out, pay for her meal wherever she's at, and she'll be good. So, 
That being said, we're uh, walking through this. All the redemptions are go- doing their own thing in January as far as teaching. And I just want to give us a little bit of history of redemption. We're a church plant. We're not our own thing. We didn't just pop out of nowhere. We were sent by somebody. So here's just a quick overview. If you're newer to redemption, if this is your first time, here's redemption over the last few decades. Here's where the original got started. East Valley Bible Church is founded by a guy named Tom Schrader out in Gilbert, Arizona. Some of you maybe have never been there. He's not a Christian most of his life. He's a commercial real estate guy making lots of money, doing lots of dumb things, and Jesus saves him and then gifts him with the ability to teach. And he starts this church, and it just becomes this huge church out in the East Valley. That became Redemption Gilbert. 2002, Life Connection Church over on 35th and Grand. Far different vibe. Aaron Daly, their lead pastor, says, Our original location was great, although next to it was what was a cannabis dispensary before those were illegal. That's called a drug dealer back then. So they had this... (laughs) Very proficient drug dealer next to him. He's like, it was great because we had this worship service and you could just smell it just seeping in the entire (laughs) service. Different than our folks out in Gilbert, for sure. Praxis Church Tempe. A guy named Justin Anderson moves back from San Diego to start a little hipster church in Tempe for all the hipsters that are all angsty and don't want to go to Redemption Gilbert anymore. We want our own church. And he starts this church called Praxis. Some of you came from the Praxis family of churches. 2009, fast forward a little bit, Praxis Church births their first church in Arcadia. Praxis Tempe, Praxis Arcadia. 2009, the church that made me who I am as a pastor, Second Mile Church, is birthed from East Valley Bible. So you're noticing a trend, just little churches popping up because churches say, let's send some people. Fast forward, 2011, Redemption Church. Arizona, the multi-congregational church, is started with the original Tempe, Arcadia, and Gilbert, and then Gateway quickly joined a few months into the deal. In that same season, Gilbert is sending out a bilingual church called Redemption West Mesa with my good friend Josue Lopez as the lead pastor. Again, the theme just keeps coming. Churches starting, churches starting. Redemption Flagstaff is sent out. A few families leave Tempe to go way up north to start a church, which is now Redemption Flagstaff. At the, about the same time, there's this group wanting to start a church. A few years later, they get sent down to Tucson, and Tucson is birthed with my friend Dave Goffney. In that same season, Life Connection Church, which is Alhambra, uh, 19th and Indian School, joins Redemption Church to become sort of the, the Redemption Church as we know it. And shortly thereafter, Peoria is birthed from Arcadia. And some of you are thinking, but the best is not there. Correct. So the next slide. In 2020, we're sent out. 2020, I'm off the books at Gateway. Go, move. 2021 is when we actually officially start. But 2020 is when Gateway sends us off to start this church. 2021, Redemption Arizona celebrates 10 years as a church. And now 2024, we're in this unique season. 2023, I've mentioned this a few times. Jack and I have talked about it. Redemption Church is changing. We're no longer one multi-congregational church. We're going to become 10 independent churches with seven of us staying together as a family of churches. And if you want to talk, we can talk after. But in this season, as we become Redemption Church North Mountain, a part of this new Redemption Church network, what kind of church are we going to be? Because here's what I think about. I think about why I joined Second Mile Redemption Gateway. Why some of you joined Praxis, Redemption Tempe, Redemption. Why some of you joined Redemption Alhambra. There's something in the essence of what we're doing that was attractive to you that God used to pull you in. Are we going to stay the same or is this the moment where we get too cute for our own good? Here's the prayer that we walked through last week. This was what Jesus told us to do. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's what we walked through last week. But embedded in there is something that I think is at the heart of every church plant that has ever come from a redemption church. None of us, none of the teams planted churches so that we can get a bunch of people to heaven that we've never met together. That's part of it, but that's not the only reason. If the only thing we're about was convincing people on how to get to heaven, we would have done Facebook campaigns and we would have spent a billion dollars on marketing to say, hey, you believe this, you have to believe this if you want to go there one day. It's more than that. Here's what our prayer is, is that God's kingdom would come down to earth in our hearts in our homes, in our marriages, that God's presence would be experienced here and now, not just in eternity when we see him face to face. 
And that little line in there, on earth as it is in heaven, has become our prayer. In Phoenix, as it is in heaven. That's why we're giving out these shirts. This is what we planted the church with. These with worse cotton, because we were a church, but now we got the soft cotton. <laughs> in Phoenix, as it is in heaven. Now here's just the follow-up question. How does heaven come to Phoenix? Because here's... Everyone has that hope. Whatever, whatever religious background you're from, the idea of heaven coming to earth, whatever that experience is, everybody wants that. Here's what no one's in agreement with across all the different worldviews. Well, how does that happen? Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Phoenix, as it is in heaven. How does that happen? Here's my answer. Here's been redemption's answer. Here will continue to be redemption answer. I think it's this. Through simple, local, healthy, churches, or if you want to be fancy, congregations. The Spirit of God can break through and will break through and continues to break through in whatever way He wants. But the primary, the plan A God has for this world is through simple, local, healthy congregations of ordinary, common men and women like you and I, this is the kingdom of God. This is how it breaks in through this very thing here. And I don't just restrict that to the Sunday gathering, but through simple, local, healthy congregations. So over the next few weeks, we're going to walk through. Today is simple. What does it mean to be a simple church? Next week, local. What does it mean that we prioritize local? And then finally, the last week in January is healthy. What does it mean to be a healthy disciple and a healthy church? That's what we are doing over this course of January in Phoenix as it is in heaven. So if you will, I just want us to pause and I want each of you to spend a little time thanking God for whatever it is you're thanking God because of this church. Father, thank you for Redemption North Mountain. Thank you that we're nothing flashy. We're not on the radar of anything huge or mighty. We're ordinary common men and women brought together because you loved us first. You filled us with your spirit. And now you let us play a role in allowing people to experience this reality that in Phoenix, as it is in heaven, is possible because Christ has come. The Spirit is alive, and redemption is here. God, we love you so much. Be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. If you're a note taker, vision, the vision of simple, the work of being simple, and the beauty of being simple. What's the vision of being simple? So here's the first one. Simple, what is the vision that we're after? Like simple church, that could mean a lot of things. Like we could already be overkill on what you think is simple. Too much cords up here, like this is not simple. The way, What do we mean by simple? Here's the definition of simple, and then we'll kind of work through it, is not too involved or complicated, easy to understand or do. Simplest is the Latin where it comes from, which means from one ingredient. There was simplest medicine, medicine that just had one ingredient. It wasn't like a concoction of a lot. Simple, coming from one thing, not overcomplicating, not making it too much, keeping the essence the essence. I'd say it like this, not muddying up that which God has made abundantly clear. We want to be a simple church. There's a lot of things that doesn't mean, which we'll cover, but that's what we want to be as a simple church. Redemption Church, historically, this is how we've wrapped our hearts and our minds around what God has called us to. Here's our mission statement. It's been this statement for years and years and years. We exist to birth and strengthen healthy local congregations. That is not the sexiest statement you could have on a church website. You could say a lot of the things that are like, wow, healthies. Local churches, that's what we want to be. We want to start and we want to strengthen healthy local churches. 2023 was, it, like I mentioned earlier, is an interesting year for redemption. We had all this stuff behind the scenes we were working through. But oftentimes we're in these really complicated discussions about who we are. And somebody would say, well, what's our mission statement? And somebody would say, to birth and strengthen healthy local congregations. And there was always a big group of us like, gosh, that's, that's what brought me in. 
That's why I'm here. That's what I want to be at. That's what we want to be about. So as we move forward, that's still what we're about. We want to birth and strengthen healthy local congregations. Now, here's what I know about mission statements. Nobody cares. <laughs> Pastors care because you got to, you know, prove that you did some work. So it's a, that's what we've been doing the last 10 years. <laughs> Nobody tattoos those on their body. It's like it's something you got to have as a business organization to provide clarity. You know, GC, you find your purpose. It's, we all got to do it. I get it. What's the vision of what that actually looks like? And as I've been praying about our church, I think it's the passage we just read. So I just want to bring us into the story of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4 is where we, what's happened so far. Jesus has come and lived a perfect life. He's been killed on a Roman cross. He's been placed in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. He walked out of his own grave. And then he spent the next 40 days walking around in a resurrected body, showing people his wounds, telling people he was risen, and telling them that the kingdom of God is advancing. I'm here. That's what he's done. The book of Acts is simply this. The disciples are like, what do we do next? And Jesus says, I'm going to leave. You sit still. You, those of you who have young kids, like, do not move, Jesus says, until I send my other helper. The beginning of Acts, the Spirit is sent, and it fills the new believers. And they go walking around doing the only thing they know what to do, and that's to tell the world that there is a king, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is king. And here's what happens all throughout the book of Acts. They get beat up. They get in prison. One of them gets stoned to death, which is the most graphic image you could have in watching someone die. Why? Because the second I say Jesus is king, I'm telling you, you're not king. I'm telling America, it's not king. I'm telling your sexual desires, my sexual desires, that's not king. If Jesus is king, everything else is not. And that is offensive. Not just to Roman kings 2,000 years ago, but to every person on your street. Jesus is king. You're not. Follow him. That's our call. And they go around and they preach this message over and over and over again. In Acts 4.13, which Luke just read and you guys gave way too much applause for, here's what it says. <laughs> now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, here's the response. They were astonished. Why? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's our vision. Whatever walk of life God has you in, whatever vocation, whatever sort of socioeconomic ranking you fall into, wherever God places you, sends you, puts you, that people would say, I don't know a lot, but there's something about that person. There's something about that dinky little church that took forever to get a sign on their building. They have been with Jesus, period. Like even the book of Acts, up to this point, just to like remind us of what they have, they have nothing in terms of all the stuff we have. They don't have a New Testament. No New Testament thing has been written yet. Jesus is 40 days from being in a grave. They're just walking around. They don't have any of the Christian books that you have on your bookshelf or that I have. I was convicted as I've been preparing this. I'm like, I've read so many. And that's like a humble brag and also just a con confession like, I've got more than enough knowledge to do the Christian life well. And they had none of that. Here's what they had. They had the Spirit of God in them. They knew the risen Messiah. They had memory upon memory of everything they've seen and heard from their friend Jesus. And they had each other. And they went and started local churches by proclaiming Jesus is King. My wife, as I was planning on a simple message, she was telling me a story about a blog she had read, one of her homemaker blogs. She was like, I was just really good, really convicting. She's talking about cleaning supplies. This will apply to some of you. The rest of you will be like, but here's what the blog says. This lady's talking about how she has more than enough stuff to do the job. The area under my sink is absolutely stuffed with cleaning products. Weird cloths, mop attachments that I've been pressured into buying, all the scented powers, all the clingy things that were supposed to attach to the toilet, and more. And yet, my house was not that clean. 
My grandmother hadn't had any of these things, and her home was sparkly. We live in a day and age where the, whether it's cleaning products or ketchup brands or Christian resources, you have more than you'll ever need. And we look at these men and these women in the early church, and they had none of that. And it says this. People were astonished. Why? All they knew, they recognized that these folks had been with Jesus. That's the vision of what I want. When Flagstaff was sent off, when two, Tempe was started, when two, like as we get around and think at our best, when we're most pure motives, here's what we want, is that people that don't know Jesus would be with Jesus. And people that know Jesus would walk with Jesus. And people would say of us, they've been with Jesus, period. That's our vision. It's not the most grandiose thing, but it's the most beautiful pursuit you can have in your entire life. And it's not the obvious choice in the world we live in. What does your spouse need from you? You could say a lot of things. Pick up your underwear. Yes, maybe. What do your kids need from you? What do your grandkids need from you? What does your work need? What does your boss, your pagan boss who doesn't know you? What do all the people around, what does the world need from you and from me and from us? We could list a bunch of stuff out, but I think this is it. That we have been with Jesus. Period. That's it. All the addicts, all the brokenness, all the healing, all the stuff around us that is overwhelming if you stop and take note. What is the thing we're going to offer to this world? We're going to be people that have been with Jesus. Common, uneducated, ordinary, easy to overlook men and women. But we have been with Jesus. That's our vision. Dwight Schrute, Michael Scott, other very key theologians. Michael Michael Scott tells Dwight, keep it simple, stupid. My dad says, don't mess this up. Keep it simple. Let's just be people who have been with Jesus. That's the vision. Now, what is the work of being simple? Because just because I say the word simple over and over, it's like parenting. Just because you say it doesn't mean it gets into your kid's blood or brain or heart at all. Like, there's work involved. Like, what, what are you talking? It's, it's what, how do we do this? So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you what I think simple is for us. But before I do, I want to tell you what it's not. Just some things that as I put myself in these seats and think about, I'm listening to some guy tell me we're going to be a simple church. The things that might be like, ah, what about this? So here's the first one. What I'm saying, I'm not saying simple means easy. Quite on the con- contrary. I'm not saying we want to be an easy church. Like anything in life that you make simple, it takes work to get it simple. Your family, your budgeting, your organization, your business. Like things naturally get stuff added and disorganized. Inertia of life makes things less simple. It takes work to make things simple. Like even think about teaching, communicating, which is what I do. I used to teach high school. Now I preach and teach the Bible. If someone asks me, hey, can you come teach? I'm like, sure, how long? They say 45 minutes to an hour. Like I could put that together in no time. Five minutes, 10 minutes. Because I just ramble. I don't work it. I want you to teach for 10 minutes. I want you to do a TED Talk. It would take me multiple days to put together. Why? Because it takes work to be simple. My Christmas Eve sermon message is the most simple, basic sort of gospel presentation I give all year. And it takes me the most amount of time. Why? Because it's such big theological ideas? No, because I'm trying to trim it down to the point where it's simple enough for the kid in the room and your pagan uncle in the room. Here's the gospel. It takes work to be simple. Simple. What does this mean for our church? We are not choosing an easier road. We're simply trying to stay on a simple path. Richard Foster wrote this book, The Freedom of Simplicity. And he says in there, simplicity is both a grace to receive, grace means gift, and it's also a discipline to be cultivated. So when I say simple, it's a grace to be received. How do you get into relationship with Jesus Christ? It's simple. You just receive the free gift of salvation. Done. But how do you live a life of simplicity and Jesus at the center? You cultivate the discipline of being simple. So that means for us, just so you know, the elders, the staff, the pastors of this church, one of our biggest priorities in life as leaders of this church is to simplify stuff. 
the easy thing would be, what kind of ministry should we have? Yes, 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 yes. we got to ask ourselves, how does this fit? How does this fit for just random single gal walking to our church and we offer a church that's structured this way? Are we going to make it too complicated for her? We're always thinking through that. That's what we do. We pray through that. We want to keep it simple. But here's your job is cultivating a discipline of simplicity. And we work together to keep it simple. It is not easy. It's actually a lot of work. One of the ways we're going to do this, we have this formation plan that Xavier's done a great job with, and we have all of life nights. If you haven't been, you get free dinner, free child care, and great time discussing something very key to discipleship. And our two topics this semester are scripture and simplicity. And if you haven't, those are the dates, the first Wednesday of February, the first Wednesday of April, and we're going to talk through scripture and simplicity. So our goal with that, me and Xavier, Behind closed doors, we want people to do stuff, not just go and listen to more stuff, but that's how the, the doing of the Christian life. So if you want to pursue simplicity with us, February 7th, April 3rd, sign up for those, please. Here's the next thing. Simple does not mean dumb. Like, the smartest people I've ever met have been in my college for, I got a math degree, and the professors I met are just... I mean, they have PhDs in math that I don't even understand. And I never had this huge gap of like, oh, I can't ever. They always talked to me in such a way where it was understandable. They brought it down to my level. Part of that's they're good teachers, but part of it is just because something's complicated or somebody talks in a complicated way doesn't mean they're smart. Really smart people can get to the essence of stuff. Like I was even going through like the building block, like the core elements of different things we enjoy in life, like music. Music, well, what, what is music at its essence? You can boil it down to 12, 15 notes, I think. I don't know, I'm not a music guy. Cooking, how many flavors do we have in this world? Sweet, salty, sour, one other one, and then umami, which snuck in there in the back door in the last few years. <laughs> What is this Chinese food flavor that I love? Umami. That's what it is. But whether it's my mom with a cafe out in Sun City my whole life or the the most fancy chef in Paris, they're taking five tastes and they're putting them together to make something wonderful. They're not dumb. I think of art. What is art? Boils down to three primary colors. Like, complication does not equal you're smart. And simple does not equal you're dumb. We're not trying to be dumb here. We want to boil it down to the essence. So here's a question I have for our church. If it's not dumb, you can boil it down to the essence. Does that mean Christianity is a dumb man's religion? And this will offend some of you. Yes. And no. If the person telling you what's here, preaching to you from this book, discipling you through this book ever makes the face sound like there's a bar here that you can't get to because you're too dumb, they miss the point. They were common, ordinary men, but they had been with Jesus. There is core doctrines that we must believe and core behaviors that we must be a part of. Does, that doesn't mean it's like a simple faith and you solve it in week one of faith. It just means don't, don't, don't overcomplicate this faith. It's not dumb. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They recognized they had been with Jesus. As a church leader here, I want to take the essence of the faith and discipleship and bring it to us over and over and over again. Here's the next thing I don't want to be considered. Simple does not mean lazy. Like picture you're, you're talking with your girlfriend over coffee, like girl to girl, saying, how's How's your husband? And the lady says, he's simple. No guy wants to be boiled down to, he's, how's Poulos? He's simple. How was that lady's house? How was the decor? It was simple. How was that? It was simple. Like simple can be just lazy, sort of backwoods. That's not what we're saying either. It takes work to be simple. From that cleaning blog that my wife mentioned, here's what she says. The hard truth is this. Work, work 
Work is what makes a home clean, not the products. So when we say simple, we're not saying dumb, lazy, uh. It's simple in essence, but you got to work really hard to be simple. Just an illustration from Kids World, Dr. Seuss. Cat in the Hat, best-selling kids book ever. He was challenged to write a kids book using only 225 words. Dr. Seuss, can you do this? Yes. He writes Cat in the Hat, 236 words, 11 over. But it's a big hit. He was just told, I want you to write a book that first graders cannot put down. Cat in the Hat, he produces. A few years later, he's like, I got a challenge. I want to write a book with only 50 words. Can he do it? Green Eggs and Ham. It's the best-selling book of all time based off the amount of words being used by the author. He didn't sit down in one sitting and in a simple way just pump out green eggs and ham. He worked over and over and over again to produce green eggs and ham in this 50-word gem that Ozzy Watt and all of your kids love. It took work. That's what we want for our church, to work really, really, really hard on this stuff. Like, I don't want to be a lazy pastor. I don't want you to be lazy disciples, but I don't want us to overcomplicate this. We work hard. One author says this. I'll share it again. But the first step in crafting the life you want is to get rid of everything you don't. The first step in crafting the church that we want to be a part of is getting rid of everything we don't want to be a part of. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Which means our no's in life in discipleship are just as vital as our yeses. Yes to this, yes to this, yes to this. Also, what are you saying no to? And I don't just mean in a moral purity way, but in a Hebrew says, laying down all that is weighing me down, I pursue Jesus with all I have. What are your no's? That's part of it. Here's the other one. And if I was in your shoes sitting in this, here's where I'd be the most scared is too strong of a word, but skeptical of me personally. When I'm saying, when I say simple, I don't mean weak or heretical theology because often when people get up as church leaders as ministry leaders as christian school leaders and they want to keep it simple what comes out of their pursuit of simple is weak or heretical theology on one end they leave behind the mystery of the faith and they start to simplify it down in such a way that the gospel never allowed like the trinity what is the trinity As a teacher, you do your best to explain what it is and what it isn't, and then you put your hands up and say, beyond that, it's a mystery. Salvation. What is salvation? Am I saved because I placed my faith in Jesus or because God chose me before the foundation of the world? Yes, yes. Explain how that happens. People who start to oversimplify and think they can explain the mystery miss it. That's not what I'm saying. So simple doesn't mean mysteryless theology. It also doesn't mean this, and this is my biggest pastoral just awareness as a church. We've never gone through an election season together, just so you know. (laughs) Just, we haven't. We're about to head into a fun one. There's two ways people take simplicity in theology and get too partisan or too off the horse on one side. And this is my camp currently, my stage of life, is the just preach the word camp. And then this camp is the just be like Jesus camp. So this camp tends to be conservative, Republican voting. Some of you in this room. Just preach the word. Keep it simple. And in so doing, we limit our faith to like a me taking beliefs from this book giving them to you and then you having beliefs from this book in your head now and you walk out of here a cranky christian that is not salt and light in this world but you're at a church that preaches the word i don't want that i i get the draw of that on the other side just be like jesus the he gets us campaign that i keep seeing these beautiful commercials for Not once has it called me to salvation or put my sin as the thing standing between me and a holy God. It's all beautiful and all true and wonderful, but if all you have is the person of Jesus and his warm embrace in the gospels and how he treated the down and out and the marginalized and the women and the handicapped 
and that's all you have. You have a vision of Jesus, but you don't have his finished work on the cross or the gospel. Just preach the word, yes, but don't miss Jesus, the person. Just talk about Jesus, yes, but don't miss the finished work of the gospel. I don't want to fall off the horse either way. Simple does not mean our theology is going to get partisan or goofy or weak or heretical. We want Jesus, life, death, and resurrection, and Jesus as known in the gospels. We want to be people who've obviously been with Jesus. That's what we want over and over and over and over again. We want to be a simple church, period. And the final what I don't want to be, I don't, simple doesn't mean ugly. Like, uh, she, she dresses simple. The house is simple. It doesn't sell. I don't mean ugly. Like, the best picture of the year, 2023, I'm not a big movie guy, but I had to look it up. Anybody know what it is? Nobody's going to know because it's a weird movie. I even asked the one movie buff who was in last service. I'm like, is that movie weird? He's like, it's weirder than you could ever imagine. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. Best movie. Best editing in 2023. Same movie. It's not a coincidence that the most beautiful story told, according to those voting, is also the story that had the best editing, the best crossing out, the best removing, the best taking away, the best nose. Why? Because beauty doesn't come just from adding, 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 adding. You also have to stop and take away and take away and take away. And that's true in art. That's true in movies. That's true in writing, Dr. Seuss. That's true in your life. That's true in my life. That's true in the life of this church. We say yes to a lot and there's beauty in that. But beauty truly, truly, truly comes when we start to say no, no, no. Like think about marriage. Throughout all of scripture, it's the thing that is talked about as the closest thing as a picture of the gospel. Well, what's so beautiful about it? All the yeses we get in marriage, yes. But it's also, this person has said no to everyone else for this person. Beauty in the nose. So what does this mean for our church? What are, that's what we're not. Here's what I just want to remind us of, just to give you sort of, okay, well, what does all this mean? Here's two things I want to keep simple over and over again. The first is the gospel, and the second is discipleship. What is the simple gospel? What is the simple gospel? If our church loses that, we lose. We miss it. And we're not faithful to what God has us to be faithful to. What's the simple gospel? Hamilton, another musical. Raise your hand, any Hamilton fans? It's about who? Hamilton. Does Hamilton do a lot with his life? Absolutely. He also, like a lot of guys back then and women back then, die a lot sooner than you should. And the end of Hamilton is his widow, Eliza Hamilton, who also has taken on his legacy and wanting to do good for the world and see the world change, starts in orphanages, all these things. And at the end, she says this question, not once, but twice. Have I done enough? Have I done enough? And I was reading one author talking about Hamilton. He says, I think Lynn manuel is asking that more than Hamilton is. It's like the artist's way to get into the story, his internal angst, and say, have I done enough? Here's the question. Have you done enough? I went to a funeral of a 14-year-old. We're all going to be there. When that day hits, are you okay with the answer to the question in your soul right now? Have you done enough? Lin-Manuel, have you done enough? Or is there more plays you need to write before you've arrived? And you can feel some sort of, I've done enough. Here's the answer, as blunt as I can say it. Have you done enough? Have I done enough? The answer is no. It'll always be no. Sorry. If you want a place that's going to tell you, you could get to a point where you answer it, yes, there's lots of options. But it's not the gospel anymore. Jesus has done enough. He lived the perfect life. He died the substitutionary death. And he rose victoriously and powerfully from the grave. He is enough. The finished work of the gospel is this. Have I done enough? No, God, I haven't. But Jesus has. I trust in that. That's the gospel. And we're going to put that on repeat until God takes us all home. Have we done enough? No, but Jesus has. Amen? Amen. 
And then simple discipleship. Well, what do we do now? Do I just sit in a corner now with this beautiful news that I'm not enough, but Jesus is enough, and now I'm securing him? Nope, you take the steps of following him. Step by step, painful chapter, abundant chapter, whatever it is. Here's what all of us are doing as we leave here. Jesus, what's the next step you have for me? Is it baptism? Is it purity? Is it selling this? Is it changing jobs? Is it moving away? Like, I never want to be a church that hoards stuff, especially people. At some point, Jesus is going to tell some of you, you need to go here. And as a church, I want to applaud every time somebody follows Jesus, because that's all we're about is simple gospel, simple discipleship. Amen? It takes us to our final reality of simple. What is the beauty of being simple? I want to share the quote I shared earlier. This is an author who lives in the valley, talks about simplifying your life. He says this, the first step in crafting the life you want is to get rid of everything you don't. That's where we find beauty. The word priority, I was reading up on this, came around in the 1400s. Priority. It remained a singular word for 500 years. Priority. Priority, 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 until in the 1900s where we introduced the idea that you can have priorities, plural. And now we live in the most abundant, safe, comfortable, long-living. Most of us are going to far outlive anyone else that's ever come before us. We're going to make it to our 70s and 80s and 90s. The, The young person dying is the exception to the rule. We have endless priorities in this world we live in. That's just how it is. So here's our options. We can try to go back in time to a simpler time. We can move to Pennsylvania and become Amish. Or we can figure out what it means to get rid of stuff that is not the priority. Like here's, as a church, as your pastor, I have priorities. My marriage my sons, my personal health, my relationship with my dad, my relationship with my mom, my love of hunting, my love of the... I've got lots of priorities, and you are the same. But as a church, our job is to come together and remind ourselves of the priority, Jesus Christ, period. Here's how the book of Acts says it. This is how they were described back then. I pray that when it's all said and done, this is what's said of us. When they saw the boldness of these two, Peter and John, they perceived that they were simply uneducated, common men, and they were astonished. Why? Because they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's our priority, period. And there's beauty in that. And the only way you get to the beauty of that is saying no to priorities that aren't the priority. The Old Testament has a beautiful picture of what I think is the essence of what I mean by I want to be simple. It's Psalm 27, 4, and it's King David, and it's him expressing his heart. King David was not the the best example of living life like you should, but sometimes he got it really, really right, and this is one of those moments. Here's his priority. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. What is it? that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's our priority. One thing we've asked, to dwell in his house forever and to gaze upon his beauty. And here's just the, the full confession we all must make in our heart. None of us have arrived there yet. That's why we have discipleship and the church as we take one step closer to making that psalm true, like fully true in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, that the only thing that is a priority to me is to be with Jesus. Amen? Why don't you close your eyes and I want to read the psalm over you and just pray a blessing. As I read, ask God to make this true, more true of you than it is now. One thing I've asked of the Lord, and that I will seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Father, make this psalm our heartbeat. Keep us simple. People that say, we have not done enough, but Jesus has. Therefore, Jesus, tell us what step to take next. Because the only thing that matters is you. And the only thing worth my whole entire life is to be with you in your house forever. So God, make this true of us as a church, as Christians, as disciples. We beg of you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.